Since 1887, people have gathered in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania to find out if a groundhog named Punxsutawney Phil will see his shadow, thus prognosticating six more weeks of winter. It's rather easy to predict when the residents of Punxsutawney will gather for this event because it happens every February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Predicting the weather has proven to be a more difficult challenge. Phil's accuracy at prediction has been reported at 39%, not much different from chance. The famous quote, it is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future, has been incorrectly attributed to both Mark Twain and physicist Niels Bohr. Actually, the origin of this quote is unknown, first appearing in an autobiography by Danish politician Carl Christian without attribution. Nostradamus has been credited with predicting all sorts of things he never predicted, and a long tradition of predicting the end of the world has, so far, not proven accurate. But what about predicting the price of gasoline? I suspect anyone paying attention could guess within a nickel most of the time. When people learn that ARENA helps predict the success of applicants, they often ask how predictable hiring outcomes can be. To give a good answer, you need data. We can measure the accuracy of something in a number of different ways. First, for a true-false prediction, like predicting if it will or won't rain tomorrow, we might use precision and accuracy. Precision measures your ability to make good predictions. It's the percentage of time you choose to bring an umbrella and end up needing to use it. A high precision means never needlessly hauling an umbrella around. Accuracy is the percentage of time you make a good prediction overall. The percentage of days you got it right, rain or shine. Second, when dealing with numeric predictions, like estimating the price of a home, we need something different. A good prediction doesn't have to be down to pennies accurate. If it's consistently close, we should be happy. So we look at the difference between the prediction and the actual value using a technique called R-squared. It gives us a single value between 0 and 1. The closer to 1, the more correlated the data, meaning the more predictive x is of y. Third and finally, for a decision problem, like deciding if someone's a good fit for a job, we often set our expectations based on the results. Let's say you work with two hiring managers, Alice and Bob. Bob's candidates stay only six months on average, while Alice's candidates average 24 months. Alice must have some advantage. Although she might not describe it in terms of making a prediction, she is predicting whether or not the candidates she hires will stay with the company, and her ability to predict is paying off. So how is Alice achieving this advantage? She either has better data or better reasoning than Bob does. Definitely, there's always value in more data, especially uh, when you're looking, when you're tracking uh, longer term things. So uh, we always want to have longer data. So that's a problem in a, in a sense that solves itself over time as our data uh, um, spans a longer and longer time. We also want to have more context. So we're always uh, uh, trying to understand our data better. So in that sense, you could say that's, uh, that's improving the data. Um, learning a little bit how to uh, how to interpret parts of it, understanding how the process is of how uh, how we acquire the data, and and what yeah that, that can influence a little bit how we uh, how we interpret it. Uh, but there's always uh, there's always unpredictability because it's just uh, in the end it's just a few people you know they get hired. And then maybe someone's uh, parents die, or maybe there's an economic crisis, or maybe there are, there are lots of outside effects that can influence it, and you, uh, you cannot model unpredictable events. One of the strengths, I think, of our approach is that we don't interpret the questions or make a judgment on uh, what is a right or wrong answer, or how to uh, understand someone's response. Um, which is the approach of a typical assessment, uh, like a personality test or some skill test. We simply collect the responses of the users and then match them with the, the actual behavior that we see later in the data. So in that way, we find patterns and we, we truly let the data tell us uh, which things are correlated and which things are not. We're not necessarily going for a 100% accurate model. Um, what we try to do with our metrics, so there are like two sides to this. So there's like the statistical metrics, which directly measure um, in some way the accuracy of our models. And then on the, on the other side, there's, there are more business side metrics like reduction in turnover. When hiring, being able to predict whether or not a candidate will remain in a role is not an easy prediction to make. 
It's also not a prediction that can be done on a one-size-fits-all basis. Every role and environment is different and requires different professional characteristics for a new employee to achieve success. One example could be that uh, someone who has to work with human waste uh, and is not all right with that, that might not be a good fit, or if they are, that, that might be a good indication. But the way we uh, make our models is not by deciding in advance what sort of traits would be good or not, and then looking for those, but actually we let uh, the data uh, show us. So we, say, we look at outcomes, and from those outcomes we learn. So sometimes things can flow up that we hadn't put in uh, explicitly. Our main objective is we, we want to kind of push down the dial or push up the dial on certain outcomes of the client. So in, in the case of, say, predicting turnover, we want to reduce that. And so as long as we are pushing down the needle on, on that particular outcome, then that's kind of our measure of success for the models. Um, from a scientific perspective, we kind of know that a perfect model, like when, whenever I see a very high score, like accuracy or something, I'm immediately skeptical. And, you know, maybe in the past when I was starting off in data science, I would have been gotten really excited. Um, but then there are certain ways of measuring this phenomenon of uh, super accurate models that that um, you should be suspicious of. Just like with weather prediction, there are limits to how accurate a good predictive model can get. A key to success in good predictions is building a model that's well suited for the actual problem at hand and identifying what traits or features to consider. In our modeling, we uh, adapt uh, uh, the way we uh, treat uh, the importance of, of certain features. Um, uh, depending on what role they're applying to and even where, uh, because all that context can be very important in, uh, in determining which, which features matter and which uh, are less important. The term predictive model can be a bit ambiguous. What exactly does it mean? Essentially, it's a mathematical description. If it's a good description, it's effective at making predictions. Predictive models are often successful because they find patterns or information that people are not good at observing. An excellent example of this is the classic Monty Hall problem, a game whose ideal strategy is not intuitive to everyone. So the setup is pretty simple. You are on a game show, and you are a contestant on that game show, and you're presented with three doors. Behind one of those doors is going to be a new car, which is great. But behind two of them is a goat. I don't know why it's a goat, but it's a goat. In any case, the you're given you're given an option. Just pick a door, and you know, and then we'll see. Do you win the grand prize? So you pick a door, and then the announcer says, oh, "Okay, great, wonderful. It's glad that you've picked your door. Um, but before you really we finish this up, before you make your final choice, let me just show you something." And they the uh, announcer opens up a door and shows, not the one you picked, and shows that it has a goat in it. And then he gives you a choice. Do you want to switch? And most people feel, it's just like this instinctual feeling, like it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter at all whether I switch or not. But in fact, if you unpack the math, you actually gain, um, it's two out of three, honestly, that you get by switching versus your one out of three shot by just staying where you are. Let's review this game a little bit and then talk about why it's the optimal solution to always switch your door. To understand this problem, we have to think in terms of beliefs. So where do you believe the prize is to begin with? You have three doors and you have no information telling you where it could be. So speaking statistically, you think there's a 33.3% chance that the prize could be behind each of those doors. Or another way of saying it, your belief that the prize is behind door number C is one third. So at the start of the game, you have no advantage. You should select randomly because you have no knowledge of where the prize can be. The next thing that happens is the host has to take an action. The host is required to open one of the doors for you and show you what's behind it. Now let's consider the host's options. They don't want to reveal the prize to you because then you would just win the game right away. They want to keep the prize hidden from you. If by chance you pick the door with the prize already, then they can randomly pick one of the other two doors to show you because they both have goats behind them. So if by chance you pick the prize door, you should definitely stay with your choice. 
and when the host offers you the option of switching, you wouldn't want to do that. But of course, you don't know with omnipotent certainty where the prize is. So let's consider the other scenario. What if you had picked a door that has a goat behind it? Which, by the way, you're going to do two-thirds of the time compared to one-third of the time you would pick the prize by chance. Now, if you pick a goat door, the host is in a bad position. They don't have much of a choice of what to show you because the two doors they have to open are either a goat door or the prize door. Then the host is forced to reveal where the second one is, and by the process of elimination, you would know where the prize was. What you should realize by now is that if by chance you pick the prize door, you want to stay... If by chance you picked one of the goat doors, you want to switch. So at a glance, it feels a little bit like a coin toss. Why should I have a preference for staying or switching? Seems about the same. But recognize you're going to pick the prize door much less often than one of the two goat doors. So on average, if this game repeats many times, you're going to win more often than not by always switching because it's more likely you picked a goat to begin with. And if so, you want to go with the optimal strategy in that case, which is to switch. That's all predicated on the fact that the host revealed new information to you. The mathematics that underline this idea are called Bayesian statistics. It's a powerful tool, and one that allows data scientists to take advantage of interesting situations like this that are sometimes counterintuitive to people, but for which the statistics tell a much more informative story. To me, when, the, when I first heard that, that just seems so against kind of my, my nature, and it, it challenged me very much and made me think, where else in life am I going with what is my gut instinct and it's leading me in the wrong direction? And I have a lot of missed opportunity. And to me, arena is very much like that. When you have a, a list of candidates, you're looking to fill a, a role, a lot of recruiters and people, just human nature, you have this idea in your mind of what that successful candidate's going to look like, uh, what they're going to act like, what their education might be, or any number of, of uh, biases that you may have. Let the math give you another option. And that's, that's really why the Monty Hall pro- problem really resonated with me when I, thought, when I started to learn more about ARENA. We've heard a lot from our data scientists and other folks who work inside of ARENA about things that we can predict, things that we can't predict generally in the world. There is so much more information, more data available in the world today than there was even five to 10 years ago. Information that that we and other organizations can collect and use to make predictions that are more accurate. Whole industries are getting changed by this. So the stock market is one example. So can we predict which way a stock will move or which way a stock will not move? Um, Not with 100% accuracy, but a large portion of the financial services industry is actually moving towards the model of using data about the stock market and about the world to predict more accurately where stocks are going to go. And as a result, hedge funds are making huge amounts of money that regular stockbrokers who are doing it just based on the limited information they have available to them are not able to do. And that's one of the reasons why those kinds of hedge funds have done so well. Netflix is another example. So before Netflix, think about Blockbuster, for those of you who know what Blockbuster is. So Blockbuster Video, you'd go to a section of Blockbuster Video and they would say, you just came to the action section. So here's a movie you might like, or they'd have an advertisement in the window. But if you go to Netflix and you use Netflix, Netflix has information about you that allows it to predict typically with much higher levels of accuracy, what you're likely to want to watch. Amazon is another example. So when you think about sort of how we think about purchasing products, you know, before the advent of things like Amazon, you'd look for an, you'd look at an advertisement on TV or in a magazine or in the newspaper, and it would say, are you interested in this product? And probably a very small portion of those advertisements were things that were interesting to you. But when you use Amazon, Amazon is able to predict with much higher levels of accuracy what you are likely to want to purchase. And they're doing that by using the kinds of data that's available today. And at Arena, that's what we're doing. We're using those ideas. We're using those technologies. We're using the data and information that is available today that wasn't available even five or 10 years ago to make predictions about a workforce, to make predictions about a job applicant. Is it 100% accurate? Not necessarily, but it is much more accurate than other ways of making hiring and talent decisions. Thanks for listening.